Jesus is the greatest example of fully trusting and doing what God has said. That should be our motivating factor. Our drive should be to do God's will. And your pursuit for happiness should be to glorify God. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I titled this message, Jesus Painted a Masterpiece. So John chapter 19. And let's all stand as well as we read here. John chapter 19 and verse number 28 to 30 is where we'll read all together. So if you're there. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You may be seated. Now, it's a very good thing to come to the end of something that has been going on for a while. Something that's been waiting to finish. In my office, oftentimes, if you ever happen to go by it, there are a bunch of random objects. And they may not mean anything to you. But believe it or not, each object is to tell me, to remind me, that I have a project to finish. Each object represents a project I have to finish. And that object has to do with that project. And it's nice to see when near the end of the year that more and more objects are disappearing from my office because it means that projects are getting done around the, around the building. And you know the building is getting upgraded as time is passing. And it's a nice thing to see that eventually there is a finish line, right? For me, at least, in my office. Now, in 1503, there was a famous painter in Florence, Italy. He painstakingly put together a painting. It was his hobby. He wasn't a painter by trade or anything like that. But he was working on multiple paintings at the same time. But many of those paintings that he was working on were, remained unfinished, even at the end of his life. So he finished a few of them. But this one painting that he worked on, he determined to finish it. And eventually, you know, painstakingly, unlike today, a painter, when it comes to trying to find his paint, trying to do his job, it's not as easy as it is today as it was in the 1500s. In 1500s, um, paint wasn't as easy as it is to go and buy at the store. Uh, what a painter had to do was buy his raw materials. He had to buy his raw ing ingredients. Uh, looking into it, in fact, chances are this painter, he had to travel oftentimes from, from Florence to Venice. In Venice, he would find the Ottoman traders. And these Ottoman traders, they would sell him minerals, and these minerals he would have to crush, and then he would have to buy beeswax. Then he would have to find uh, grapeseed, and then he would have to extract his own oil to use for his paint. So it was a painstaking process to make your paint in order to get your painting done. So this one man in Florence, Italy, took four years to finish this one painting. Does anyone have a guess of who this is? Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci would have perhaps been the happiest person to have finished this one painting that we know of him. Da Vinci took four years to paint up the Mona Lisa, and it was all to gift to a merchant. He, drew, he painted up his wife and finally gifted to this merchant. Today, the Mona Lisa is highly regarded as a masterpiece of the Renaissance. 
Some have even gone as far as saying that Leonardo may have even invented a painting technique to come up with the painting and how it looks like. So he, Leonardo, if he didn't finish this painting, it may have just been lost in history forever. And I believe that God also finished a masterpiece on the cross of Calvary. He finished a masterpiece out of love for humankind. Now we know the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The cross was the culmination of that verse. Jesus did three different actions to prove his love toward us. And in light of the Lord's table tonight, we will take a look at them and learn how we can do God's will in our life. So, without further ado, let's open up in prayer and then dive right in. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, that we can always remember your love when we have the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. And I pray, Father, that even though it's a symbolic thing we do, the amount of suffering, the amount of love that you had for us still emanates through it. I pray, Father, that we in, our, in ourselves, in our hearts, that we would settle how much you loved us and how much we ought to seek to do your will in our life as well every day. I pray, Lord, that in this message that you would get a hold of our hearts now, that you give me the unction and the power to preach. I thank you and praise you, Lord, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to move it here. So, the first point here is Jesus painted his suffering. Jesus' crucifixion, as you know, and as I pointed out, is the apex of his ministry. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. This was the ultimate reason Jesus Christ came to earth. This was what all those prophecies in the Old Testament were finally culminating to, the cross of Calvary. Those thousands, uh, those hundreds of thousands of different words that we find in our Old Testament are all pointing to this one final act, this momentous occasion. In Christ's crucifixion, other than Christ's deity, the fact that we can see that Jesus was God, we also see Christ's humanity, that Christ was also man. And it's revealed in a, humanly speaking, in a very pathetic picture. We look to the cross. And when we look at the cross... We see a man who's been disheveled and we see a grotesque picture of Christ. A pathetic picture of man is seen. And I want you to also understand this. The picture of Christ, when we look at the cross, is actually a picture of us. And here is what I'm going to try to show you. It was a picture of what sin had done to humanity. There was a story I was reading, and it's pro it was written by a, quite a provocative type of man back in the 1800s. This man was a controversial man. He was an author, and he was a playwright. His name was Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde wrote about a fictional character named Dorian Gray. And Dorian Gray, in the story, Dorian Gray, he was a young aristocrat, a rich man, young man. And he inherits a giant fortune from his parents. And then he eventually moves to London, where he meets a man named Basil. Basil, he is a painter. And when Basil finds Dorian, they become good friends. But Basil also found Dorian to be very enchanting. He found him to be a very beautiful man. 
And as the story proceeds, Basil, being a painter, he wanted to end his career on a very high note. So he decided, I want to draw, I want to paint Dorian Gray in my painting so I could end on a high note because I think Dorian Gray is one of the most beautiful men I've ever seen. Well, along the way, Dorian Gray also meets another man named Lord Henry. Lord Henry was a hedonist. Lord Henry sought after pleasure with all his wealth. And every time Dorian would speak of good things, Lord Henry would bring up the bad things, the pleasurable things in life that you could use your wealth for. And so as time passed on, Dorian would talk with Lord Henry and what he would realize is Lord Henry had something to say to him. He had Basil and then he had, uh, he had Lord Henry. One day he was talking with Lord Henry and he told him, you know, Dorian, looks won't last. So you should seek after pleasure in life. Because pleasure, pleasure is good. Because, you know, you, one day you will age and you'll lose all your beauty. So Dorian kept talking with Basil and he said, Basil, I, I, wish, I wish that this painting could take my aging. I wish this painting could take whatever sin I commit and whatever marring of sin that would happen to my soul, that this painting would take it instead. And Dorian, he essentially, he exchanged his soul so that he would never age in his life. As time passed on, Dorian, he went into the pleasures. And the story is not very good, but at the end of the story, Dorian eventually finds this portrait, this picture of, that Basil had painted of him. And it had all the scars, all the marrings. Eventually, it was this grotesque picture that Dorian could not handle to the point where Dorian was disgusted. This picture was Dorian's heart. You see, the scene of the crucifixion was a grotesque scene. There Christ hung as a picture of the sins of the whole world as God sees sin. The pure white canvas that was Christ was ruined by our sin. Christ took upon himself our sin and those that were there that day finally got to see their sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. Some have asked, did Jesus really have to die? Did it really require him to die? The answer is yes. Because there is no other way. And here... In our verse that we just read, it says that he received vinegar. Look at verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar. Jesus, at this point, it's coming near the end. And Jesus was in an absolute pain. Our bodies, the human body, there's something about the human body when it it receives extreme amount of pain. Our bodies, they tend to go into this sense of shaking and shiver when it's receiving extreme amount of damage. And I think you know what I mean. As the body begins to pump more blood into the areas that have been damaged, it causes the body to spasm. And this, the Romans knew very well, will take place on the cross. And they were hoping that the body will spasm because it hurts longer and hurts more. And so the idea during crucifixions, the Romans would give vinegar and they would mix it with gall so that it would give this effect of anesthesia, a numbing sensation, so that the victim would stay up on the cross just a little longer 
just so the body spasms a little longer. The Romans had offered him vinegar and gall. Not just this time. They had offered it also prior. But you know what? Jesus rejected it. He could have gone through the crucifixion with less pain. But he chose not to. He did not take the vinegar. Christ fully wanted the suffering that he was going to go through. Just as any human being would. What a savior. The second point I want to show is Jesus painted over man's religion. Let's go back to verse number 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Every religion in the world will claim that man is to continue to do until the end of their life. Man must continue to do until the end of their life. But Jesus said, it's done. It's finished. It's interesting. Because often religion will also claim you need to do more good than you're bad. I think many of us are familiar with that kind of concept. You ha it's kind of like an accounting term. But any person that was truly honest and sober would also recognize that no amount of good we could ever do can ever outweigh our bad if we were truly honest with ourselves. It's like if we were to have a bucket and we filled this bucket with water, but then every time we sin, there's a hole that was placed in the bucket. Now how much water will that bucket hold? How many holes does it need to have? Just one. See, religion, what it truly is, is it was just a man's invention. Religion is really just an invention made by man to appease sin debt. The man who invented religion was Cain. All the way back in Genesis. Cain, he tried to pay for his sins from the fruits and the vegetables that he so tirelessly grew. But when God required a lamb to be slain for his sins, Abel, his brother, gave the offering and God was pleased with it. But then Cain kept insisting to God that, no, look, my crop is good too. But that wasn't what God required. The statement from Christ in verse number 30, it is finished, was his proclamation that the greatest debt of mankind has been paid for. No religion will ever pay for our sins. Let's turn quickly to Romans. Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 and verse 23 to 25. <clears throat> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Christ paid our sin debt. Only the death of God, let that sink in, only the death of God can pay for your sin. Jesus took our pain. He took our suffering because we gave him a ton of money. No. Freely. Freely. You know, oftentimes in religion, gods, in mythology especially, 
gods dare not even come down to earth, let alone die for their creations. And sometimes there are gods that do come down to earth, according to these mythologies. But oftentimes they come in incarnations. They don't even come down the way they are to deal with man. And oftentimes they just deal with specific groups of people, not the whole world. But Jesus Christ made his sacrifice effective to every single people group. When I was growing up, I, I was often hesitant to tell kids at school um, where I was from. I, when I grew up in elementary school, my elementary school was in Quebec. And it's a lot different from life here because there's not as many immigrants back then in, in Quebec. But I oftentimes hesitated to tell kids uh, where I was from. And they would ask me, are you a Paki? Are you Indian? What are you, Saudi? Are you from Iran? No, I'm from Sri Lanka. Oh, guess what question they asked next? Where's that? <laughs> See, uh, growing up in elementary school and high school, I started to notice, man, there's groups of people I really want to be a part of. There was, uh, back in elementary especially, there was a group, they were from Lebanon, and they were the Lebanese clique, right? And then there was another other clique, and these guys were the Polish guys. And they, they had a clique. They were really good at soccer, too. And there was, like, a Filipino clique, too. And I was trying to, like, where do I fit in? I, didn't ha I, I had no clique to actually fit into, no group to actually fit into. And oftentimes, you know, it's, it, it was like, I, I, don't, I don't belong anywhere, you know? It's like my country, it, it, it doesn't feel as important because there's no group of them there. At least that was how it was for a young guy going from elementary school to high school. So it's like I kind of downplayed where I was from oftentimes. So when I was reading one of the booklets that Pastor White wrote, the booklet number four, which is The Promised Savior, the promised Savior, something clicked in my mind. Something clicked in my mind when I was reading that booklet. Jesus died for me. Jesus died the way I saw it at first. Jesus died for a random little Sri Lankan boy. Where's Sri Lanka? What does it matter? amongst these many nations, much greater nations. Where is this? And Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, a random Sri Lankan boy who immigrated to Canada, God in the flesh died for me. I'm not Bill Gates. I'm not Elon Musk. I'm not Mahatma Gandhi. I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm just Stephen. And God died for me. I'm not anything special. But Christ paid my sin debt. I don't have to go to the Buddhist temple anymore and meditate to pay off my karma. Because Jesus is now my refuge. He's paid it all. I don't have to pray to gods in the Hindu temple because Jesus has taken my sin away and even made me a son of God. And what a sobering thought that God would make us worthy in his sight. That God would take our sin upon himself and make us free. We don't have anything to boast about. Jesus really did it all. Jesus did it all. And finally, I want to show you Jesus painted for God's glory. The theme here is that Jesus painted a masterpiece. And Jesus painted for God's glory. All along Jesus' life, his push, his drive, his motivation 
was to do the will of the Father. And when his task on earth was complete, he gave up the ghost. That's what the verse says. Let's go back to John 19 here. John 19, in verse number 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You see, all four of the Gospels, they record that Christ, in fact, was the one who gave up the ghost. And why is that significant? This was a big reason. One, this was one of the biggest reasons the Roman soldiers had to actually check whether he was dead or not. Because it was out of the ordinary. You see, what usually happens when on the cross, the victim would be hanging on the cross, and oftentimes they'd be, you know, they, it would almost look like they're going to die. And it's like the life was ebbing out of them. And usually they can see that a person is about to die. But with Jesus, it is finished. And he gave up his ghost. He had the power over life and death. And this is one of the biggest reasons that we have a living God, a living Savior. Because it takes a living Savior to save people, right? Instantly, he gave up the ghost. He has the power between life and death. He even said this in John chapter 10. Let's turn there quickly. John chapter 10. He even predicted this to be happening. Or prophesied, I should say. John chapter 10, verse 17 to 18. It says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So, the moment he was done, Jesus gave up the ghost, just according to God, how God had asked him, how the Father had asked him. That is so that he could glorify God. Jesus died so that we may live. And then he rose again. He died so we may live more abundantly. Now, don't misconstrue what abundantly means. It's not abundantly in physical wealth, of course. It's abundantly in spiritual wealth, in our spiritual life, in our relationship with God. There is, you see, there's a lot of spiritual treasure to be found that no amount of knowledge in this world can give us. God will give wisdom to his children to do his will on earth. God promises us a place in heaven and we pass from a road that's heading to hell to a road that's heading towards heaven. What a gift. We are given a gift. But I want to ask you something. How is your relationship with God? An honest question. If you're someone who has never really accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, today is that day to accept it. Repent of your sin. Turn away from it. Turn away from the things of this world and start looking towards Jesus. This world will offer you things that will make you happy only for a moment. But only Jesus can take, can offer you something that will truly satisfy. And praise the Lord, it satisfies. Jesus is the greatest example of fully trusting and doing what God has said. That should be our motivating factor. Our drive should be to do God's will. And your pursuit for happiness should be to glorify God. Oftentimes this world gives all kinds of nice distractions. But your pursuit for happiness should be to, go to glorify God even if it means great discomfort. 
Because that's honestly the greatest apex, the greatest form of obedience. To be willing to be in discomfort, to obey God. Now Christ, he bowed and he gave up the ghost. That's a great reminder that God will not take our life until he is done with us on this earth. Until his purposes have been fulfilled on earth, we will remain. There are so many things that could possibly threaten our life oftentimes. And often fears come out of this idea that, oh, I feel threatened. My life is, who knows what's going to happen. That's where fear often comes from. And often there is a fear of death. But you see, just as we read it, God is the one who holds the key, the keys of life and death. So perhaps we should ask ourselves, is death such a bad thing? Is death so bad? Because I might even propose, if you say yes, death is bad, then perhaps there is too much of an attachment to the wrong thing in this life. Because Jesus Christ should be our only object of faith. You know, if Jesus had, if Jesus had not done what he did on the cross, why are we here? We are all gathered here in remembrance of what? Right? So I'm going to conclude here. Tonight is a communion service. And it's time to recognize and remember the sacrifice of Christ. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. But don't forget why all of those things took place. There's a reason for all those things taking place. Jesus wanted to fulfill God's will. Christ took upon our humanity so that he could take upon himself our sin. The ruined and grotesque marring that took place on Christ's body is to show us how sin look like, looks like in the eyes of God. Christ paid all the requirements of religion. Our sin cannot be paid for by what we do. Only Jesus can pay for our sin. And then lastly, there is no need to fear death because Jesus has the power over life and death. He offers us a life that is much more abundant, a life that is more fulfilling than what this world can offer. And this is not something that is a mystery. The will of God, it's not something that is a mystery. There are many things about God's will that we already know of. And I'll just bring out a few. I don't have any verses right now. But to love God with all our body, soul, and mind. To love people as much as we love God. To pray without ceasing. To be thankful in all things. To go to church when we are able to go. To give to the Lord when you have the opportunity to give. Especially your tithe. To present your body and life to God in surrender, to preach and teach the gospel to every person, and many other. We have a lot of what God wants us to do in our book. So you're still on this earth for a reason. And we all have been given a life to live. It's like we are working on a painting. So, make sure your painting is for God's glory. Let's pray. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.